Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our second Ready for Life Digital Festival. Now, this is an annual event that's brought to you by the CPF Board. I'm Mark Van Kallenberg. Some of you may know me as the Flying Dutchman, and it's my pleasure to be your host for this opening forum. Now, we have got a very exciting lineup of webinars and online workshops over the weekend covering various dimensions of well-being, intellectual, physical, emotional, social, and financial. You'll hear from close to 30 speakers on how you can live a vibrant and purposeful retirement and start planning for your retirement with CPF. Let's begin this morning as we welcome Dr. Tan Si Leng, Minister for Manpower, to deliver his opening address for this forum. Dr. Tan, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see everyone here at the second Ready for Life Digital Festival. And thank you to the CPF Board for bringing this exciting event back after a successful inaugural run last year. Like many countries, Singapore has an ageing population. About one in four Singaporeans will be 65 years old and older by 2030. By 2050, this will rise to almost one in two. Against this backdrop, we want to assure Singaporeans that they can always rely on their CPF as their foundation for greater peace of mind when they retire. We are supporting older Singaporeans who wish to continue working to stay active, to have a sense of purpose and to maintain social connections. As of 1st July 2022, we have raised the retirement age to 63 and the re-employment age to 68. From 1st of January next year, we will introduce higher CPF contribution rates for employees aged above 55 to 70, and this is to help our seniors accumulate more savings for their retirement. As part of the ongoing Forward Singapore exercise, we will continue to review the CPF system to ensure that it remains relevant in meeting Singaporeans' retirement needs as it evolves over time and it becomes more diverse. We are also building on a strong and robust CPF system. In a recent Global Pensions Index published by Mercer and the CFA Institute, Singapore CPF was ranked the top pension system in Asia in 2022 and ninth out of 44 retirement systems reviewed worldwide. Service delivery enhancement is also important. The Tax Us pilot launched by CPF Board in September, which enables members to send their queries in conveniently via WhatsApp, was well received by many users. The Board will continue to leverage chat-based digital service to offer a more intuitive and a more tailored experience to members transacting online. By early next year, a new chatbot will be introduced to help self-employed persons make MediSafe contributions with greater ease. Retirement will be the beginning of an exciting chapter in our lives. In Singapore, one in two aged 65 today can expect to live beyond 85, while one in three can expect to live beyond 90. So many of us can expect to spend a good number of years in active retirement. I encourage everyone to view retirement as transiting into a life stage where you continue to value add and to make other people's lives and livelihoods even more meaningful. Planning ahead will help all of us to better enjoy our retirement. Personally, I discovered my passion for walking just as I reached about 50. And I find that walking allows me a certain sense of calmness, tranquility, to reconnect with nature, to bond with friends when I walk with them, and also to appreciate the presence of that moment. And it also reinforces the fact that we have to continue to maintain active mobility, activity, just like how important it is for circulation for the entire body. It is the same with our society, with the country, with our people. We've got to keep moving. 
As American chess player and author Robert Byrne once wrote, the purpose of life is a life of purpose. We must continue to find meaning in the things that we do. For some of us, it could be keeping in touch with our loved ones, our friends, or spending quality time bonding with them. For others, it could be volunteering for a good cause, or picking up a new hobby or sports. A sense of purpose and strong social connections are reasons for us to get out of bed every morning and shapes how we respond to life's challenges and uncertainties. We are more likely to feel more energized, give that spring in our step and can help us better cope with stress. The Ready for Life Digital Festival has been carefully curated to help you identify meaningful pursuits and show you how your CPF savings can be your foundation for a happy and vibrant retirement. I commend CPF Board for its efforts in organising this festival. And I hope everyone will be inspired to reimagine retirement. Let's get ready for that golden chapter of our lives. Thank you. Let's start with this. You have been a banker all your life. Was that your first love? Actually not. Uh, my aspiration was really to be a diplomat. And the reason for that is that I had this uh, fascination to travel and see the world. I thought uh, being an ambassador would allow me to do that. Uh, the way uh, the Indian system worked, I was in India, is you had to be uh, at least 21 years old to take the examination. Okay. And I wasn't 21. So I went to business school as a stopgap till I got to the right age. Uh, and when at business school, I, my eyes opened up to the private sector. Uh, Citibank, which is a multinational bank, uh, made me a job offer. And uh, I suddenly realized that this was actually very similar to my aspiration to be a diplomat. It, they let you travel, they sent you overseas, you could travel and see the world in a different domain. So I sometimes call myself an accidental banker. This was, <laughs> this was not the agenda, yeah. uh, but I wound up there. The reality though, FD, is that within a few months, actually the first three or four months, I realized I had accidentally jumped into what was my calling. I just fell in love with the profession and I've been now doing this 40 years. And I, I tell people, there hasn't been a single day in these 40 years where I have not wanted to come into work uh, because it's just been the right profession for me in many ways. You know, we, we, a lot of us in Singapore, we see you as the man behind DBS. Where did you actually start in banking? Well, I started with banking at uh, um, Citibank and the first uh, assignment they sent me to was in Calcutta okay. uh, in uh, 1982. And, you know, in those days, the trainee program was you went and you were given responsibility to supervise a department of clerical staff. Right. And it was in the back office operations, you know, running, writing the checks and doing the entries and supervising the queues in the lobbies. Mm. Um, and my biggest consternation then was I was 22 years old and everybody else in the department must have been 40 or 50. They're older than my father. Right. I didn't know how to supervise people who are older than my father. Right. You know, how do you get them to work for you? Also in those days, Calcutta had the most uh, 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 antagonistic uh, trade unions in the country. This is a communist place. Trade unions are very difficult. So, you know, learning how to deal with trade unions and working with the people was not uh, easy. Mm. Uh, but, so I started from there. But I tell people, the first two or three years is when I learned my banking. Because you get the chance to roll up your sleeves, get under the hoods, really understand how the system works. Right. And I never looked back. No, because, you know, you, you started, you, you started, what, 1982, you 82, said. 82, right. And I, as we introduced you, you're doing so much now. You seem to have such a busy life. Um, do you ever get burnt out at all? I mean, if you do, how do you overcome it? Oh, actually, uh, and the truth is I don't get burnt out. And I tell you that two dimensions to this, uh, FD. One is, in my career and my job, I've always found that as long as you keep learning mm. 
and doing different things, you keep growing mentally. And as long as you grow mentally, you don't burn out, you don't stultify. Mm. Um, even today, you know, think about how the world has changed in the last five, seven years. You know, the internet world, the mobile world, now blockchain, cryptos, uh, the green revolution. I didn't know any of this stuff. Right. I learned on the job and I, I read extensively and I talk to people. Yeah. So my mind's always learning and I think that's a big way to not burn out. But the second thing is I also um, have a lot of me time and I do a lot of things outside of banking. Frankly, I, I sometimes wonder, uh, about a fourth of my DBS job is not DBS. It's, you know, national stuff, it's country stuff, it's, you know, I'm the National Research Foundation or the university. Mm. So that gives me an input which is different from banking. Uh, but also my personal life. I, I carve out time for myself every morning. I'll do yoga and meditation. I, I, I make sure my weekends are pretty much uh, my weekends. Uh, and I have a lot of eclectic interests. I'm, I'm very varied and broad in the interests that I have. Okay. Um, what sort of interests do you have outside of banking? What, what do you enjoy doing? Well, I, um, you know, it's a straight thing. I enjoy nature. So, which is why I'm on the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. I'm also the chairman of something called BirdLife International, which is one of the largest conservation organizations in the world. So I started bird watching when I was young. Okay. And uh, I still try to get out, uh, you know, every few uh, uh, times, uh, every other month to look at birds around uh, Singapore mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so nature is a big thing for me, but uh, also words. I'm good with words. So I like writing. I like poetry. I do the cryptic crossword religiously every morning. Wow. Business times. I do wordle every morning. <laughs> uh, I scribble poems for people on their 50th, 60th milestone oh, birthday. Wow. So I enjoy, I read a lot. So I'm, I'm, I'm good with words. I, I enjoy travel a lot. So if I can, I get out to, you know, all kinds of uh, unusual off-beaten places because I uh, just like exploring. Off, offbeat, unusual places? You know, a lot of them are, um, um, actually, even though I grew up in India, the large parts of India I'd never seen or explored. Mm. So I like doing that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was in Iceland, I've been to Peru, I, you know, so just off the beaten path, I yeah. like to go and um, slum it out oftentimes. I, I've got to say, Peru is a great place to visit. It I, is fantastic. I love Peru. Yes, I loved it. Now, in an, in an interview, you mentioned you're a firm believer of uh, everything you must do must be relevant to a, a, a bigger context. So I then asked the question, what does purpose mean to you personally? Well, um, you know, I'm going to, um, some years ago, we brought in the Authentic Leadership Institute from Harvard to help DBS think about what DBS's purpose should be. And they did a very interesting exercise. They started off by asking each of us to spend half a day to think about our own purpose. And so I've given it some thought and I came up with the statement which I wrote down at that time, uh, which is, I really think my real purpose is to try and help shape tomorrow's world by making a difference to people and the planet. Uh, and I do think in many ways, um, you know, because I think I, ca I can be strategic. I have a knack of being able to take a position on a point of view on trends and therefore participating actively in helping shape where I think technology, the world, etc. are going. Because I think at the end of the day, it's about people, it's about humanity, it's about what planet we leave for our kids. And if you can play, and if I can play an active role in trying to shape that, uh, that's really a good thing. Yeah. Now, you, that, that's, that's pur purpose to you personally. You've been in Singapore for a long time. Uh, you, you've worked with a multitude of people here. What do you think purpose means to the average Joe in Singapore? You know, I think the fundamentals around uh, purpose change. Um, so you have to be able to cover what I think are um, the bare essentials. Mm. If you have a health problem, right, if you're not healthy, then purpose is about, you know, what do I do about my health, mm. right? And that's, that occupies your mind, it's overwhelming. If you haven't put aside the means to be able to, you know, help you through the rest of your life, the financial means, then the problem is about wealth. How do I make sure I survive, you know? So that becomes a singular purpose, you know, how do I make sure I can survive, I get uh, uh, this thing and so on. Um, but assuming that you've taken care of the basics, mm. you know, you've, you've got over the health, you've got over the, you can make a living. Um, I think the average Singaporean has moved on from what we used to call the five C's. In those yeah. days, the purpose used to be, I need my condo, my credit card and so on, the yeah. club. Today, the more and more of the Singaporean, the people I talk to, 
uh, really want to try and think about uh, bigger things, you know, issues about from how do we make a difference and how does Singapore stick around to what do I give back to community. Mm. And especially for the younger generation and frankly even my generation, I'm hearing this increasingly, you know, what can I give back and what can I give back mm. to the community. And that's actually really refreshing um, for me. Okay. Uh, uh, some akin this post-pandemic period to the great realization. Uh, what's your advice for people who are currently feeling unsure about their journey through life? FD, I, um, I want to maybe narrate a story perhaps. Okay. So when I was 40, I decided to quit banking and go set up a dot com in the first internet revolution. Mm. Uh, I was uh, Citibank's country head for Indonesia. So I had two young kids, but I said, okay, forget this, I'm going to try. I went back to India to set up this dot com. And my safety net, my contingency plan then was, uh, I'd save some money being a banker. I mean, it wasn't a lot of money, but I said, okay, I go back to India. It's, you know, a relatively cheap country. Mm. If it doesn't work, I'll retire. And if I retire, I'll do some institution building, I'll do some other stuff, but I can survive. And the dot com didn't work, but neither did my contingency plan. Oh. And it didn't work because uh, of the three basics, two, three basics I talked about. One, uh, the whole uh, NASDAQ had crashed, the stock markets had crashed. So, you know, the roughly plus minus few hundred thousand dollars I had in my nest egg suddenly went to half. And that created a sense of panic. So I realized I hadn't planned enough for my financial well being. Mm. Uh, as a consequence of the failure of the dot com, I went into a depression. So I hadn't thought about my mental well being or my physical, the health mm. part of the well being uh, either. And then the third thing that struck me as 40 years old, I was trying to retire and I didn't have a community because everybody I knew, they were all working nine to five. So what do you do with yourself all day? Yeah. If there's nobody else you can go hang out with. Yeah. And so I, I sort of came back to banking, which is my you know, love by then. I knew I, I enjoyed doing it. But I took this lesson away from there, that you've got to make sure the health and the wealth, but you've got to plan. Uh, and you've got to constantly plan for what is it that you will feel satisfied by. Um, and it sounds morbid, but I say, you know, on your deathbed, when you look back, what are you going to say, hey, I you know, regret not having done this, and I'm really happy I found time to do this. Mm. Now, I think that, you know, for a lot of the young kids, deathbed is a long while away. Yeah. But this idea of always looking, setting an end goal and working back, right? And say, okay, what are the things that will make me happy 10 years from now? And what are the things I'll regret when I look back at the last decade? I think that's a good way to operate. And it's unusual because a lot of the young kids today don't plan, mm. right? And I think mm. it's mm. a, uh, when I talk to them, say, oh, kids don't plan, things change, I'm so young, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But every time I've had a serious conversation with young people, and told them it's not a bad thing to telescope backwards, I think the point registers. It's, I, I tell people that in the context of your careers. Mm. You know, you think about what job you want to do 10, 15 years from now, do you want my job? Then you can plan, what should I do, you know, 12 years, 8 years, 5 years, and 3 years from mm. now. Mm. So my first advice is that, spend a little bit of time telescoping backwards, it's always a good thing. Uh, my second advice to people is don't, I mean, the biggest problem with today's um, um, uh, times is the pace of change is accelerating. Mm. And we're all getting overwhelmed. It's very easy to get overwhelmed because, my God, if this is happening, that is happening, this is changing, you have FOMO, I missed out on this, I wasn't in the stock market. It's very easy to get overwhelmed. Uh, you've got to be grounded uh, in what you are and you've got to uh, be comfortable with yourself. And once you that, then the FOMO and the, the desire and the, you know, the, the envy, mm. you start to be able to put that to the side. I think that's a big part of the anxiety we have. Mm. It comes from FOMO, desire and uh, uh, envy. Yeah. Uh, and the third thing uh, to me is find a broad set of interests, things that you enjoy doing and start planning and preparing uh, along the journey. Right. So if you enjoy music, make sure you find some time for the music. If you enjoy sports, make sure you find some time for sports. I made that mistake in my 20s and 30s. I was so consumed by work, I did nothing else. It's one of my big regrets in life. Mm. And it, I found it very difficult to go back and pick up mm. what I had uh, uh, left along the way. Mm. So don't give up on things. You know, keep your interests going, keep your friends going, keep the community going. 
this anchors you. Mm. And so in this time of anxiety, you need these anchors. You need things to be able to hold on to as you go ahead. I think that's a, a useful thing to hang on to. It's interesting because you're saying find things outside of your work, your, your sport, your whatever it may be. But I think a lot of Singaporeans will tell you that I really don't have the time. How did you find the time? Did you physically set aside hours? Yes. So I believe that um, you've got to be disciplined with your time uh, keeping and management. And uh, even though I, I do you know, so many different things apart from the bank, I have some portions of time which are me time, which are sacrosanct. So I, I, I'm up at about 6 in the morning. But the 6 to 8 slot in the morning is my time. So I'll do my meditation, I'll do my yoga, mm. I'll go mm. for a walk, I might go to the gym. I don't let anything come in the middle of that, mm. uh, my time. And my weekends are generally my time. So I'll keep one block in the weekend, 3-4 hours, when I might have to do some stuff. But I try to keep the weekends to do the other things that I want to be able to do and yeah. devote time to. So you're, you literally block away work. I, I block away work. I'm also a little bit happy. I don't carry work in my head. Ah. So I can compartmentalize. A lot of people find it hard to. But I think you can train yourself to do that. Mm. Okay, thank you very much for your sharing. I do want to go to one or two questions that have come up for us. Um, one of them is, uh, were there any pivotal moments where you questioned your career choice? Where, where, where you weren't quite sure? And what was your takeaway from these moments? You know, this goes back to the question of purpose, uh, FD. Um, for the first time around the great financial crisis, which 15 years ago, when bankers and banking started getting pilloried, mm. you know, people started thinking of us as what somebody called uh, the great octopus or the squid, or, uh, and banking started uh, being uh, defined as one of the you know, most uh, unpopular professions. Mm. Uh, I did go back and figure, you know, everything that I do, does it make a difference? Is it worthwhile or do people, am I just being egregious, it's a good paying profession, etc. And uh, so that is the one time when I actually thought hard about it. Mm. And then I actually convinced myself um, that actually banking makes a big difference. You know, if you think about uh, helping people to save, to invest, to grow, helping small businesses to become big businesses, helping people to find a house early in their lives, helping to make the what I call intermediate time. You know, you have needs when you're young and you have money when you're old. Mm. How do you bridge that gap? These are actually good things. Uh, society in the world would not be what it is today if it is not for an active and productive financial system. Mm. And so I did have some questions at that time, but I got over those. I convinced myself that as long as you're doing the right thing, if you're doing the right thing, real things for real people, right. I think it's a great profession to be in. You know, you're, you're, I've mentioned this before, you're a busy man, but is there, uh, and this is the question that's come through, is there that one thing, I know in the morning you do your yoga and your exercise, but is there that one thing you look forward to on a daily basis that's outside of the CEO of DBS Bank? Well, I told you about the words thing. I love my cryptic crossword and word. Yeah. But the one thing these days I look forward to is I speak to my grandchildren every day. Oh, wow. Um, I have a young two and a half year old granddaughter. The boy can't speak. He's only six months old. But it's completely redefining. And as I move from parenting to grandparenting, you know, this is another passage, rite of passage with time in my 60s. And I realized that being able to spend time with family, with the grandkids, it's just so special. Mm. And I want to be able to create the capacity to do that in all I look forward to it every day. Um, any tips for, for young adults who are just starting their financial or retirement planning journey? Anything you want to say to them? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, a lot of people before me have expounded on the power of compound interest. right? It is generally the case. You know, compounding makes a dramatic difference. And so if you start early and start putting away a little bit of money, even a small bit of money, but do it on a regular basis, the compound effect of it in 5, 10, 15 years is extraordinary. Uh, it's stunning. So start early. Uh, the second is you can plan. You know, at DBS, uh, in the last couple of years, we introduced a financial planning uh, instrument, NAFTANA, we call it. I've been stunned. Uh, almost 2 million people downloaded the app. Uh, about 800,000 people use something every month, savings, wow. investment, planning. Mm. About 150,000 people have actually set up a retirement planning program. Now, what this app lets you do today, Singapore is so gifted. We can pull your CPF uh, balances, we pull your SRF, 
we pull your insurance and annuity, we pull all the balances from all your banks, and we can give you a full balance sheet of your assets, your liabilities, your cash flows. And then because we use artificial intelligence, we send out 30 million nudges, nudges every month, saying based on what you're doing, maybe you need to spend, set a budget on this spend. You're spending too much over here. Mm. And here, maybe we think you should be able to get a better rate on your mortgage. And this is the amount of money we think you can save and you should put it into a regular savings plan or maybe you can buy one of the lowest digital portfolios. All of this is artificial intelligence driven. Wow. And it is so dramatic that I found the people who start doing this retirement planning, it's a long-term financial and retirement mm -hmm. planning. So even the young people, it's not about return financial planning. Mm. They move from cash flow negative to cash flow positive. Okay. Uh, almost 40,000 people have done that. So I would advise people start early and then start using these tools and understanding of your position. Yeah. Don't let it happen to you. You know, yeah. you have agency. Take control. Mm. Another question that's come through is um, about connection. In Singapore, it's about being connected. It's about knowing the right people. And connections are important for success and for well-being, both professionally and socially. Uh, the question is, how do you go about building your connections? I think building connections is not about sharing your name card to hundreds of people. A lot of people have this mistaken notion of networking that you just got to go and pump a lot of hands. You know, okay. it doesn't work. You yeah. can pump as many hands as you like. Uh, I do a bootleg lecture sometimes on, you know, career planning. And uh, the first uh, lesson is networking. Networking has got a, a, a necessary condition. You've got to be competent at what you do. Mm. Once you're competent at what you do, then you have earned the right to be able to connect and make this thing with people. Uh, but the second then, you've got to be conscious about the kind of people who can make a difference to you and you would like to meet with. So again, a story in uh, 1980, 1989, mm. right, I was still in India and I decided I wanted to build my career internationally. And so at the beginning of the year, my New Year resolution, FD, was I made a list of seven people who were part of the Citibank system but who I thought could be helpful to me in my career and in areas that interested me, technology, operations, finance. And my goal for myself that year is I must somehow make connection with these people. And then you've got to be thoughtful and find the right opportunity. In one case, it was because somebody sent an email and I sent a very thoughtful response to the email. In another case, somebody was traveling into the country and I made a special effort to go. But every time you do this, you must have an elevator pitch. And to me, that is the trick with good networking. Okay. You should know if I'm going to get, you know, two minutes with somebody or five minutes with somebody, what is it that I want to stay say that will leave an impression? Mm. But otherwise, you just shake the hand and you're another ship that passed by the night. Right. So you have to be consciously thoughtful of, if I get a minute, two minutes or five minutes, what will I say with the, which will be relevant to the person? And in doing that, you don't have to think about yourself. Right. You've got to think about the person. Right. What is relevant to that person? What is going to be meaningful or interesting to that person? Mm. And if you can do that, then you wind up actually making a, an impression that stays with people. So that's my one tip on networking. Now, some of it is opportunistic. You know, uh, there's no magic for where do you meet people and how. But there is a, a process for saying, if I meet somebody, how do I make an impact? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that. Okay, next question is relating to balancing work priorities and personal life. Now, if you're a middle manager with demanding bosses and customers, how do you then block off your weekends for me time? Well, um, you know, I've been through as you know, junior management, middle management, etc. And as I said, honestly, in my 20s and 30s, I did not do a good job of balance. And maybe that's the reality of life, that early in your career is very hard to get that balance right, because you really want to throw yourself and consume yourself. Uh, but at the same time, I have many peers, people I know, who did a much better job than I did of being able to define things that they would not compromise on. Mm. Uh, that this is a given. So some people I know into sports and they say, look, thrice a week, I'm going to go for my badminton seven to nine. And that's a given. Mm. Uh, one thing that's, I think, helpful is that increasingly companies are also coming to the realization that you've got to allow people some personal time and the capacity to be able to express themselves. Uh, Gen Z for sure is making sure that companies uh, relate to that and are able to respond mm. to that in a mm. meaningful way. So the environment is actually a lot more conducive to this than it used to be mm. 20, 30 years ago. Uh, but finally, uh, I do think it's about uh, mental discipline. Two last uh, quick questions. Um, first one is, what should I prioritize? Career planning, financial planning? 
I think you should uh, prioritize career planning. Is my view. I think you know the financial planning is an outcome of being able to build a steady and strong career, right? So if you think about making sure you know what to do, how you want to get, etc., the financing and the financial outcomes uh, come alongside of that. If you're not getting an income stream, it's very hard to start yeah, figuring yeah. what you're going to plan with finances. True. The other one is, and the last question we've got for you is, any advice for older folks who are at the tail end of their career? Is it too late to start planning? Oh, it's never too late to start planning. Not at all. Uh, you know, today's world gives you so many opportunities to do different things, things that you did not imagine. You can, you know, so we started this program some years ago at DBS. People who are close to retirement, we said, you know what, we'll give you some money, $50,000, $100,000 in a grant, to go and set up a small business or company in what you uh, like to do. You like baking at home, we'll help you to say, okay, can you create an online bakery? And then you can go and see if after retirement you can pursue mm. this online bakery. You know, you don't need an infrastructure, you, know, you don't need too much. So in today's day and age in particular, there are a lot of options for what you can do. Mm. It's never too late to start planning. And similarly, from a financing standpoint, you know, lifespans are, you know, we're all going to live to, not all, I mean, um, uh, the minister just said, one in two will live to, you know, their 85, one in yeah. three to their 90s. So when you retire at 63, you've got another 25 years ahead of you. You know, can you imagine at the age of 20, if somebody told you you have 25 years ahead of you, will you plan for 25? Of course you will. Yeah. So at 60, you'd better plan for when you're 90. 90, absolutely true. Piyush, thank you so much for, for coming in and talking to us this, this morning. It's been so insightful. It's been absolutely awesome. Well, really happy to be able to do this. Thank Abby. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Several years ago at a dinner table, my daughter suddenly blurted out. She said, I want to buy the tickets to Justin Bieber's concert. On hearing that, my older son, the brother, commented, Me, why are you so silly? With the money that you are going to pay for the concert tickets, you can actually pay for many years of Spotify subscription fee. And with Spotify, you can actually listen to Justin Bieber or for that matter, any artist, any songs, anytime, anywhere. And to that, my daughter retorted, God, it's a different experience. You have no life. Thankfully, the conversation stopped then and then and we could have a peaceful dinner. But many years later, on thinking back on that conversation that was around the dinner table, I thought, well, that might be a conversation between a person who believes in a YOLO mindset or has a YOLO mindset and a person that believes in fire. And surely we can learn something from that conversation. A very good morning to each one of you and thank you so much for joining us this morning for CPF Ready for Life Opening Forum. My name is Chris and I'm the CEO of Provident. In the short 15 minutes that I have, I hope to really inspire each one of us to think about how we can plan for ourselves by first making life decisions before making financial decisions to enable these life decisions, especially as we come to the end of 2022. You see, most of us, we have this thing called the money equation. And the money equation starts first with uh, income. We all earn and income. And you have heard Piyush earlier, he talks about the importance of income. So we all earn an income, and after taking away the expenses, we are left with a surplus. And with the, the surplus that we have, if we invest our money, we get the returns. And if the returns compound year after year, we hope to be able to reach our future goal. But let's start first with the YOLO personal money equation. YOLO stands for you only live once. For a person who believes in YOLO, he believes that, or rather he lives like there is no tomorrow. And that is why he decides to live it up today. And because he lives it up today, he racks up a lot of expenses. And as a result of that, his surplus, he leaves himself with very little surplus. His surplus, as you can see from the slide, it goes down. But at some point in time, the person with the YOLO mindset realized that he has also got a plan for tomorrow. But because now he doesn't have a lot of surplus, 
he would be able, or rather he would need to be able to get good returns or high returns to be able to achieve his future goals. But as we all know, the higher the return we need, the higher the risk we need to take. And the higher the risk we need to take, the higher the uncertainty of reaching your goals. The higher chance of it affecting your health because you are so gripped by the performance, the ups and downs of your investments. The higher chance of it affecting your family relationships. Because when markets are down, when things are not doing so well, if you lose money, you get angsty, and that may affect family relationships. And the higher the risk, the higher chances of it affecting career because you are so focused in your investments and because you have lost money, that may take away your thoughts on your career, your job, that may cause distractions. And of course, the higher the risk, the higher insensitivity to community issues because you have no heart, no time, no mind for it. And if you have a faith, the higher insensitivity to spiritual matters. So if we adopt the YOLO lifestyle and we have the YOLO mentality, that can lead us to buying things that we don't need with the money that we don't have to impress the people we may not even know. Let me say that again. Having that mindset may lead us to buying things that we don't really need. We want to live it up now, but we don't actually need those things. And we use money that we don't have, we borrow. And to impress people that sometimes we don't even know or they don't even care about us. And that will lead us to being gripped by money and what I call a servant to money and worship money. And having that YOLO mentality to the extreme may lead us to live a life of discontentment because money is never enough. So this morning, the first question I want to ask all of us is, are you a YOLO? Are you living that life of a YOLO? Or do you have that mindset, the mentality of, oh, come on, we only live once, so live it up today. Do you really, really want to be a YOLO? The second money equation that I would like to share with all of us is the FIRE money equation. FIRE is a Western idea. It's a philosophy that came from the West and it stands for financial independence, retire early. A person who believes in FIRE believes that there is always a tomorrow. And because there is always a tomorrow, he delays gratification to the future. And so, what he does is he screams and he saves and makes certain sacrifices on the activities that he may want to do today. So he keeps his expenses as low as possible and as a result, he has got huge surplus. But, well, for a person who believes in fire, what he really wants in keeping his expenses low is that he hopes to be able to achieve financial independence and retire early. So he also invests aggressively to get the returns that he needs or he wants so that he can reach his future goals as soon as possible. Now, fire sounds better than YOLO, but a potential drawback of YOLO or rather of fire is that we have that assumption that there is always a tomorrow. But if the last two years has taught us anything, it is that, well, sometimes our loved ones and ourselves, we may never have a tomorrow. And certain activities we cannot orchestrate. There are certain moments in life that we cannot orchestrate once the time has passed. And I was listening to Piyush talk about it just now, and he did mention the same thing, that he had some regrets in life, and you know, you can't reorchestrate it anymore. So, the drawdown of fire is that we don't have a contract with God. None of us have that contract with God, and life is uncertain. The things that we should do now, that we might want to do now, well, we may want to defer into the future, but we may not get a chance to do it. Either the loved ones that we want those activities for, they are no longer around, or we are no longer around to do those things for them and with them. Some important things like building memories as our children, they grow up. 
And as our parents, as they grow old, we can't orchestrate these moments when the time has passed. And so the drawback of having that fire mentality is that we might live a life of regrets. So that's the problem with the extreme or the purest form of fire. And so to balance between YOLO and fire, can I offer all of us a third money equation? And that is wisdom. The wisdom money equation is a balance between the extreme mindset of a YOLO and the other spectrum, which is fire. Wisdom stands for with intention, cease daily on mission. A person who lives with wisdom, well, this person is still prudent. He lives a prudent lifestyle. He only spends on necessity. And as a result, he manages to keep his expenses low as well. And because of that, he has got a good surplus. But the difference is this, between a person that has wisdom and a person that believes in the extreme end of that fire mindset, is that with the surplus that he has, he doesn't just invest everything into the future. With intention, he decides what are the important things that he must do today that is meaningful, that he knows that he cannot orchestrate it again when time has passed. So he determines these activities, all the things that he needs to do, and he allocates his money, his finances into it. I call those things purposeful activities. And if he does these purposeful activities enough on a daily basis, he will live a purposeful life today. But he doesn't just put his money into these purposeful activities. With the surplus that he has, he also set aside and invested towards his future. And if he gets the returns that he needs compounded over a number of years, well, he will achieve his future goal. In wisdom, there is contentment. And in wisdom, if life takes you away today, you should have very little regrets because you have done the many important things today and not defer it to the future. But if life is kind to you and you live a long life into retirement, well, you are prepared for it. And that is why I said in wisdom, there is a better chance that you will live a contented life. So what is contentment? Now we always talk about contentment, but what is contentment? Contentment is when you reach a stage whereby you no longer crave or desire anything that you don't already have. It is not a passive acceptance of your situation. And by that, I mean, you know, it's not like what we Singaporeans say, you know, no choice, no choice, you know. So I didn't plan for it, but since, you know, it fell on my lap, no choice, I'm contented, I'm contented. I'm sure many of us have heard people saying that, right? Oh, no choice, okay, I'm contented. But I'm sure deep down in their hearts, they are not contented. They accept life as it is. That is not contentment. It is not a passive acceptance of your situation. Contentment is a conscious choice of enjoying, appreciating and accepting what you have. It is an active pursuit of things that are important to you. But yet, you know that you cannot have everything in life. And so you are prepared to give up the cravings of the other things that you do not have. That is contentment. And therefore, it requires all of us to know what is important in our lives and accepting that we cannot have everything. And you see that in the wisdom equation. With the surplus that he has, he intentionally decides what is important today that he must spend on, perhaps on our, in, you know, on our parents, our children, even on things that today we feel that passion to do. And seizing daily, doing this thing daily, with a missional mindset. That is the mission equation. And as I have mentioned, 
if we have wisdom and we adopt that wisdom mindset in planning for our lives, in making financial decisions, then we have a much better chance of living a life with no regrets. The last two years have been really tough for me. About two years ago, in July of 2020, my father died suddenly due to a heart attack. Well, while he was old, he was not frail, he was not weak. So when he died suddenly, it, was, it came as quite a shock and it was quite unexpected for us. One and a half years later, in July of 2021, Suddenly, my father-in-law was diagnosed with cancer. And very quickly, he deteriorated. And in December of 2021, he passed away. Before he was diagnosed, he was a strong man. We never really expected him to go so soon. Three months later, in March this year, my mother passed away. Well, although my mother was weaker than my father in terms of health, we thought that she's still going to have many years, or more time at least, with us. But that was not to be the case. Just a month before my mom passed away, my daughter left for overseas to do her undergraduate studies. And my son graduated this year in July and started working. And just recently, my wife, who my health is not too good, her health took a turn for the worse. In the span of two years, I lost all my parents. My children grew up so quickly and they are living their own lives today. They don't have that much time with us now. And I think it's fair enough to say that my wife will no longer have a normal life expectancy. So life is uncertain. Sometimes we cannot defer everything to the future. We gotta do it today. We don't know. We don't know. And so my simple message to all of you today, this morning, as you listen to this opening forum, is that no, you don't only live once. You only die once, but you live every day. So don't just live like there is no tomorrow, because sometimes there will be a tomorrow for you. Or just live like there is always a tomorrow, because life is uncertain. I want to encourage each one of us to live with wisdom, with intention, knowing the important things that you need to do today, build memories with your loved ones, cease daily, do it daily with a very purposeful and with a very missional mindset. Because as I mentioned, if life takes you or your family away, you will live with very little regrets. But if life is kind to you and you live a long life and you need lots of money for your retirement, then you are well prepared to do the things that you want. I hope that gives you some handle for us to reflect and I hope that gives you some thoughts on how you should be planning for your life and how you can be arranging your money to support these major life decisions in your life. And with that, thank you. Now, I know you're probably thinking, what has sport got to do with you know, retirement planning and you know, the rest of our lives for those of us above 50? By the way, I'm 56. So it's that time where I myself am also planning and thinking about my own future. So today, I want to share with you something really interesting that I perhaps maybe some of you have not heard about. And uh, being a lecturer at the university also, I do, uh, do a little bit of scientific kind of stuff. So if you don't mind me, I'll share with you a little bit of science. But it's going to be a little bit more practical uh, on the basis of what we're going to do. Now again, 
when I was listening to Mr. Piyush and even to Christopher talking about, you know, uh, what they were talking about just now, I found something very interesting that a lot of the things that they were talking about actually reflects exactly what I used to do in terms of working with elite athletes. And I used to work at the Singapore Sports Council, now called Sports Singapore, where my role was very simple. I was to mentally prepare or help my athletes mentally prepare themselves for major competitions like the SEA Games, Asian Games, Commonwealth Games, and the Olympic Games. And so a lot of times when athletes are planning and thinking about their sport, they set goals like what Mr. Piyush said. They also break it down into smaller bite-sized goals. Trust me, even today, I'm still working with elite athletes. And they're teaching us every day how they achieve success. For them, it's very stressful, such is life. We all have to go through many stages of our lives from school to work to parenting and to have grandchildren and financial planning. So all these stages of our lives are actually changes in our lives and change is stressful. Likewise, when athletes go for competition, every competitor is changed for them because why? They have to adapt. They have to adapt to the changing situations and sometimes even no matter how good they are in terms of planning for their opponents and what their opponent's gonna do, guess what? Their plans sometimes you have to throw out the window. So through the past maybe 15 years or 10 less, less than that, we've done quite a lot of uh, research in sports psychology, not just me, but my colleagues around the world. And we found something very interesting and I wanna share this with you today. A lot of times we talk about resilience, but you know what? There's more than that. In fact, the research is now showing that mental toughness, mental toughness is the phrase or catchphrase of the future and even now. Why? When you look at this slide, you will realize that resilience really is about just coping with whatever life throws at you and in sports, whatever situation your opponent comes at you. But new research, when they surveyed and they studied elite athletes, world champion holders, uh, record holders, world champions. You know what? They had more than just resilience. They were not passive people. They were people who actually stood out because they had that confidence in themselves to be able to seek out. Key word is to seek out situations that actually help them succeed. So likewise, the same concept applies that in life, we need to seek out the challenges rather than fear it. Because when you start to fear, that's where you get more stressed out. And you know what? You take on a more reactive approach. So as I mentioned just now, when they studied Olympic athletes, they looked at all the mental skills, the psychological skills that were crucial in their success. And they found something very interesting. Of the list of about a 10 to a dozen items on that list, I'm gonna just choose one. And that one is top of that list and it rated about 90 over plus percent upon 100 in terms of importance and also helping them achieve Olympic success. And that is confidence. Confidence is the self-belief and trust in yourself that you're gonna make it even though you're facing tough challenges. And this study was on the Olympic athletes who participated at the United States uh, uh, Atlanta Games that they hosted in 1996, which actually I was also the team psychologist for Team Singapore in that particular games. And I witnessed with my own eyes the champions that came out of that Olympics. And I can tell you, they are one bunch. Now, before I show you this video, I want to just share with you someone who just retired, I think everybody knows. Yeah, Roger Federer just retired. So I thought maybe i pick out this uh, video from Time Magazine online, of course, to just kind of talk a little bit about retirement. Now, again, honestly, I don't like the word retirement because I feel that kind of locks you in. But at the same time, elite athletes have to plan ahead. A lot of times, elite athletes have to find ways to anticipate what they're going to do after they stop competitive sport. And you and I know sports careers are pretty short. And once that time is over, you know what? A lot of times, their self-esteem, their self-image drops. Why? Because all of their self-worth is tied to their physical capabilities and prowess in the sports arena. 
everything about them because they lived their lives when they were children all the way to elite levels doing sport. So that's all they knew. And here's a lesson for us. That here day, you and I also, many of us are perhaps working adults or you know, doing something very important in our lives and you know, helping the family. Guess what? That time will come when you're going to make that transition. Are you prepared? So here's something. Elite athletes always plan ahead. That's something we do a lot because they have to think about what if I stop? What if I stop my sport? There's still life beyond sport, competitive sport. Some of them come back as coaches, some of them come back as officials, some of them, you know, volunteer, they do all kinds of stuff. And in fact, in this program, uh, in this whole weekend, right, there are some people who are also doing sports and they will offer some of those uh, programs for you, right? So let's look, dwell a little bit deeper into this part in terms of Roger Federer's uh, retirement. He is rated one of the world's best tennis players anyways. So let's watch this little video clip. Sometimes you get unlucky, sometimes the opponent's better, sometimes it's just not your day. You can't win them all, uh, but at the same time, you can give all you have. In the beginning of my career, it was almost painful. You get disappointed, frustrated, play a terrible match at the end, and you're like, ah, I should have done so many other things, I shouldn't have behaved the way I did. Today, I can analyze it much better in the very moment, and I think this is what experience is all about. Roger Federer has become the first man to win 20 Grand Slam titles. So that little clip was just to kind of like give you a glimpse of the man himself. But what I want to focus was actually the quote that I kind of took from one of his comments years ago. He said, I dreamed. And I believed and really hoped that I could do it. So I put in a lot of work and it paid off. Now, when I think about this one, it applies to retirement planning. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the word retirement because that's the word we typically use, right? But allow me to do so. So the point is, athletes are always thinking ahead. Mr. Piru said, you know, set your end goal and then work towards it. I'm like, hey, when I was listening to him talk just now before I came uh, for my turn, guess what? It kind of rang a bell for me. And I hope that rang a bell for you too. So I'm going to share with you something really practical because any other day, all this is talk, right? So I want to also share with you something that I teach my national athletes and the, the people who need to perform under pressure. So let's do a little activity if you could, please. Yeah? So I'm going to ask you to follow this instruction wherever you're seated or listening to this uh, streaming. And I'm going to say in a few ways, in such a way that, you know, it's still the same message. All right? Do exactly as I say. You ready? Do exactly as I say. Here we go. Do not, I repeat, do not think of a pink elephant. Stop thinking of a pink, pink elephant. You know elephant? Yeah, pink colored one. Stop thinking of a pink elephant. Put the pink elephant out of your mind. Stop thinking of that pink, pink elephant. Now pause for a while and notice what happened in your mind or reflect upon what you experienced just now. Now, when I do this little exercise with my participants, about 90%, if they were you know, following my instructions, they would have thought of a pink elephant. Or you have thought of an elephant that wasn't pink, or you thought of something pink and it wasn't an elephant. Either way, there was either one of these two things that appeared in your mind. And so, here's the thing. Your mind thinks in pictures. But we talk to ourselves all the time. That's what we call in sports psychology or performance psychology, self-talk. Okay? So we talk to ourselves. And the problem is, based on research, right? Majority of our thoughts tend to be negative. And being a Singaporean, yeah, we tend to complain or complain a lot. Guess what? The complaints typically are talking about what's wrong, talking about what's not going right. And therefore, what happens is that we're creating those unconscious pictures of what we don't want in the mind. Okay? So therefore, the key principle for us in this case is to think what is it you want, not what it is you don't want. And your thoughts are really powerful. So as you think about your future, as you plan for your rest of your lives, think positive and literally positive because that is power to your own self-belief 
And when we talk to athletes and high performers, they tell us this, that we need to think positive even though when things are crumbling around us because we have no choice. We have to survive. We have to win or we have to do whatever we need to do to survive the situation. Therefore, thinking positive is not something we take lightly. So, but I want to do one more quick one. I want to share with you research that was done in New York University. Now, normally when I do a little bit of a workshop, I get participants doing this without me telling them the answer, so to speak. But I'm going to do this as part of this because, you know, we don't have that interactivity as much as I would like. But it's okay, you still learn something from here. So here's something that they did. They got people to walk through a passageway. So pretend you're walking through a passageway, you're going for a language test. You sign up for this test, you know, you volunteer, and then you sit down in this uh, exam hall, so to speak, and then you will go through this list. And their jobs were to descramble this list of words that you see on the screen. Now, some of you who attended my workshop before, I know some of you are attending this uh, streaming now. Uh, I've done this several times, so please don't share the answers. But the point is, the thing is that you notice that the words, when you read left to right, they do not sound grammatically correct, yes? Right. So the people in this language test were asked to descramble it. Okay? And then when they're done with this kind of multi-pages long test, they will walk out this passage hall that they came from, and guess what? Unknown to them in this research, okay, it's a deception study, they call it, yeah, deception. So they didn't know that they were being tested on anything else, they just thought it was a language test. <laughs> so guess what? They found that when the people walked out, right, of the hall, exam hall, so to speak, they found that the timing was different for two separate groups that were given two different sets of words. One set of words were given uh, what we call uh, neutral words, and the other one is called elderly words. Now, if some of you are just kind of curious what those words were in terms of gramma, grammar, guess what? This is the list. And you will see here that all the words, right, when you descramble it, and you read carefully every sentence in there, every sentence would have some words associated with being old. Okay? So example, worried, replace, old, stubborn, wrinkles, forgetful, dependent, dependent, helpless. All these words were actually words that were priming the people unconsciously, psychologically, when they were doing the test and they didn't even know it. And how we knew where that, those sets of words had impact upon them was shown in the results of that study. And the result of the study showed very simply, the people who were exposed to elderly words actually walked slower. Now, when you look at this chart, you might seem, hey, wait a minute, it's a bit confusing. Taking more time means a higher bar. So you look at the grey chart or grey bar, it means that that group is the elderly group. They were exposed to the words that were talking about old and all that, dependent and things like that, forgetful. And they actually walked slower, almost double, almost double. The other group that were given neutral words. So the lesson for us is this, right? That any other day, the words you use, especially the negative words, be very careful because they have impact on your thoughts. They have impact on your emotions and definitely impact on your behaviours. So, the lesson here for us is this. The basic language of your mind is in the form of pictures and images. Remember the pink elephant? Right. So that one, you got no choice. That's how your brain works. But, take note, the words you speak to yourself and to others, because when you speak to others, you are creating images in their minds. And therefore, pay attention to what you say to each other, pay attention to what you say to yourself. And the secret to all of this is focus on what you want and not what you don't want. And with that, I want to thank you all for your uh, attention and I hope that what I've shared with you is useful. That any other day, to go through these live challenges, you need to think positive and be confident of yourself. And confidence is one key, in fact, the number one mental toughness skill in life that you can use to go through all the challenges and the adversities in your life. Thank you so much.
Um, it gives me great pleasure now to uh, invite our distinguished panelists to join us. We have Christopher Tan, CEO of Provident. Thank you very much, Chris. We have Mr. Edgar Tam, sports performance psychologist and founder of Sports Psych Counseling. Edgar, thanks for joining us. We have Mr. Tan Lee Hua, Chief Financial Officer, CPF Board. Thank you. And seated right next to me is Ms. Ong Bi Yen, model, co-founder of One Degree C, a cold brew coffee business. Bien also launched an ageless and multifunctional fashion collection and she upsizes or upscales or upcycles actually old and discarded furniture as a hobby. I think that's an amazing hobby, by the way. Thank you. I never thought anyone would do that. Um, ups, uh, just, just upscaling old furniture. I have so much furniture I must give to you. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's begin this. I'm going to start with, with Edgar this morning. You spoke about how mental toughness can help us bounce back from setbacks in life, right? Um, my question is, is mental toughness something that people with strong characters are better at? And does it mean that we need to be less emotional about things? Right. Good question. And thank you for the opportunity to share. In fact, studies show about 50% of your personality or your, the way you handle life is personality. personality. The other 50% is actually the skills that you pick up along the way through life. And I believe, and also in my work, and also the research supports this, that people can actually develop mental toughness. That's why we've been spending, what, for me, past 27 years, teaching people how to be mentally tougher. Mm. And these are skills that even children can learn. So we even brought these skills down to uh, primary school level kids to help them learn so that they will have these mental toughness skills when they get on to you know, do things in life later. It, it's interesting because when you did the comparison just now between resilience and mental toughness. Mm. I always thought that resilience would lead to mental toughness or mental toughness would lead to resilience. Well, the, the research is a lot newer. Mm. So therefore, what I would say is mental toughness is a superset or resilience is a subset of mental toughness. That means you need resilience, but you need other skill sets. And one of that is confidence that we were talking about just now mm -hmm. and, and other skills that we, we do teach in, in the work that we do. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to move on to, to, to BN. Um, I love the term elderpreneur, uh, an upcycling enthusiast. You became a successful model in your 60s. What an amazing achievement. Um, and you also launched a line of ageless fashion with a local fashion brand. Um, did mental toughness play a part in how you have successfully reinvented yourself? Mental toughness to me is actually a journey of um, perseverance, discipline and not giving up so easily. Um, let me just give you, uh, share with you two okay. examples of my journeys. I came out of retirement at age 60 um, to help my husband set up a cold brew and cold tea business. Uh, he was retrenched. Sorry. And, uh, you know, and um, yeah, so we did, decided to do an online business. Uh, my first R&D of a cold tea was a blue pea cold tea. It's blue, naturally blue in colour, made from uh, blue pea uh, flowers. flowers yeah. When I saw that, I said, I want to create three other teas that are natural in colour, uh, no flavouring, no artificial flavouring and natural sweetness. It took a lot of perseverance, uh, a lot of R&D, a lot of uh, taste tests, um, a lot of setbacks, you know. And uh, for one of the flavours, which was a yellow coloured, natural colouring fla flavour, it took me over a year. But I'm glad to say my perseverance paid off. I've got four teas, red, blue, yellow, green out in the market right now. It's healthy, it's flavorful, and uh, it's naturally sweet. Didn't you ever at some point go, you know, you said there were setbacks. Didn't you ever at some point go, look, I'm in my 60s, man. I don't need these setbacks in my life. Seriously? Actually, no. Um, for me, it's, um, okay, for example, I've always set goals in my life. Mm. Uh, I told myself by age 17, I want a driver's license. By mid-20s, I want to earn a four-figure salary. Uh, between uh, f 
you know, my mid 40s and 50s, I want to retire. When I reach 60, I want to grow my grey hair out. And uh, I t tell myself, this year, I want to have a fashion line. I want to, uh, you know, be able to collaborate with the local brand to come up with a fashion for seniors that's uh, versatile, that's uh, um, budget friendly and uh, age appropriate and fashionable. Um, yeah, it took a lot of hard knocks. I approached a few uh, local designers, but they didn't seem interested. But I, you know, my, I tell my husband, my husband calls me a go-getter because I always ask him to go get here, get this, get that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, um, you know, I'm a go-getter. It's like I'm very determined. And I tell myself, cover all avenues for as, as much as you can until you really can't, then you tell yourself, I've done my best. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm very grateful, Yacht 21, when I approached them, you know, they, uh, she believed in me mm. and she felt there is a, 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 a business for, for uh, fashion like that. And uh, yeah, three, three months ago, I had my first capsule wardrobe collection. Wow, yes. that is quite something. I, I do like that. Um, it, it's, I, I'm harping on this, I think maybe because your age and my age are closer yeah. than High five, high five. <laughs> high five, we got, we got, we're, we're, we're there, we're there. Um, you, you've got all this now. Um, is it enough? Do you want more? I mean, I, I, I don't think about it, but when something comes to mind, it's like, yeah, maybe I should do it. You know, um, well, recently, that, there is a business that came to mind and I tell myself, maybe I should try that. Or, you know, like my grey hair, you know, everyone keeps saying, oh, you've got very nice grey hair, what do you use, this and that. And I've been trying to get that, that out in the ma right. market. Uh, it's still in the baby stage, you know, but... Yeah, I'll try always. If I can't, I can't, but at least I, I try it. So it's, it's not a matter of, oh, I'm old, you know, I, I can't do it. Yeah. It's just keeping myself active. I don't know. I think my mind just works, you know. In such a, you're such an example for everyone, I think. I, <laughs> the I, fact that you, you, you really are a go-getter. But you're also a... a <laughs> no, I like my radio, you know. <laughs> on my weekends, I chill with my Netflix, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, not quite the go-getter that, that you are, but yeah, yeah, because it, it really is something. Um, okay, let's, let's move on a little bit. Um, Chris, you touched on a very scary aspect that, that related very much with me. Uh, it did resonate very, very strongly um, because I, I had, I had a, an experience a few years ago, um, and it changed my perspective on life. I had, for those of you who don't know, I had a heart attack a few years ago. And um, you get this frightening feeling of, no, I'm not ready. It's too early. I haven't, things are not done. I haven't completed everything. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's worrying. And that doesn't help the condition that you have. Um, what can we do, Chris, to, to ensure that we take care of our loved ones, really? Yeah, thanks for sharing so uh, vulnerably yourself, uh, FD, I can imagine the fears. I think a lot of times when we talk about planning for the future, I mean, we think about financial instruments, legal instruments and all that, but perhaps I can share very quickly the three areas that, you know, we can plan for to be more ready. I think the first area is about living your life purposefully each day. I mean, Bian has shared that. Exactly. I thought that was really yeah. a, an inspiration. And by the way, I told her that my wife uh, you know, knew that I'm going to do this with her. And she said, wow, 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 you know, I, I, I want to live like her when I grow old. <laughs> but she is really, you know, how each one of us should live. We live purposefully each day. And we can start today. We think about those important things that we want to do, meaningful things that we want to do, especially with our loved ones. Mm. Our parents are still around, our children growing up. Do these things. And if we do this thing daily, when it's time for us to go, even prematurely, we are ready, mm. right? Because we have done, within our constraint, we have done what we need to do with them. Mm. But secondly, we plan to mitigate any life risk that comes along the way, mm. right? Because in planning for our future, there will be life risk. So think about losing your income in the event of death, disability, or a medical condition. Yeah. Think about the increase in medical expenses when we are really ill, mm. right? So put in place a comprehensive insurance plan. Speak to your trusted advisor to put in place a comprehensive plan so that if these things happen, you know that you are financially ready to take care of yourselves or for your family. 
The third area I think that we can plan for is to leave behind clear instructions when our health fails or one day we go. I mean, one day we all have to go. Right? So put in place a lasting power attorney, a LPA, to give clear instructions to your loved ones. We call that a, a donor. Right, to know exactly how to handle your personal welfare, your, uh, your property, uh, when you are no longer able to do it yourself because you are mentally incapacitated. Put in place an advanced care plan so that your loved ones know exactly your care preferences mm. and you can no longer make them. Hmm. And for those of us who do not want life support when we are terminally ill, speak to your doctor and put in place an advanced medical directive. Mm. Now, after you have done all that, and I call this end-of-life planning, as I mentioned, one day we will die. We, we can't assume we're going to die at a ripe old age of 85. Sometimes death can happen to us mm. now. So put in place a good estate plan. And by estate plan, I mean make sure that when we go, our family has got enough money to live on. We try and preserve our assets as much as possible. At the same time, have a good distribution plan to distribute to our intended beneficiaries. And the last thing is a legacy plan. I mean, we always talk about legacy and estate planning interchangeably, but legacy is different. Legacy is beyond an estate plan. Legacy is about leaving behind gifts whilst we are still alive. But I think more importantly, values that you want to leave behind in the gifts that we give. Mm. As I shared earlier on, my mother passed away March this year and she's not a rich woman, but somehow months before her death, she knew that it was about time for her to go. And so she went to a bank account and she took out some money. It wasn't a lot of money. And she gave to all her grandchildren. But the thing is that when the grandchildren received those gifts, they knew why grandma gave those gifts to them. Mm. And to that, I said that she has done a legacy planning. Right. Nothing legal, nothing on paper. Mm. I think that's the best legacy planning we can do whilst we are still alive. Yeah, if we do these three things, I think when it's time for us to meet the Creator, I think we are better prepared because we have lived our best each day. We have taken care of life race. And when it's time to go, we know everything has been planned for. It's an interesting thing because I, I, I'm sure we have people viewing now who are young and they're going, yeah, this is all great when you're middle-aged. But I'm 21. <laughs> you know? I got a life to live. But as you said, it's uncertain. Even at 21, if you go, you can leave massive financial holes in your family savings right. because no one expected it. How young do we start? I started planning for myself when I was 19. You know, um, I think for many of us who are either the baby boomers or I'm a Gen X, uh, we don't come from wealthy families, mm. and so every cent counts, mm. right? So because I was born in the environment where my, my father was a bus driver and yeah. you know, he didn't even have enough for himself, and let alone the family, I started planning at 19 on what I want to do right now with my life, uh, my life, you know, take my degree and all that, but still plan for the future. So it is not so much how old you are, but I would say how mature you want to be. You can be very mature at a very young age, but you know you can live like there is no tomorrow, even when you are 50, 60 years old. Yeah, well, I suppose that, that is true. And I, I, the reason why I brought this up is I, I run into it a lot. I mean, if I've even run into it with my own kids, you mm. know. Really, do I have to save that much, you know? And I keep saying, yeah, the rainy day, I would suggest don't save for a rainy day, save for a thunderstorm. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And they kind of go, oh, but dad. <laughs> But, you know, you never know what's going to happen and, and you need to be prepared for it. Yeah, I guess when you are younger, uh, I understand. I mean, we have all been young before. We want to live our life and I'll say, go, go and live your life. Mm. But do a bit of preparation because once you have done that preparation, you have taken care of the contingencies, then you can really go there and live out your life without fear. Yeah, because everything's prepared for you. That's right. You, you've got the safety net in place. That's so right. Speak, so right? start now. Yeah.
Okay, a couple of things I do want to share with you. Don't forget we have the understanding and management of your health costs. It's a webinar uh, by uh, CPFB and the MOH. That's today at 2 o'clock. And the Live for Today, Plan for Tomorrow webinar on legacy planning, again, by uh, CPFB and Eden Law tomorrow. Um, but as we talk about all of this, financial planning is not easy. We don't know when we're going to expire. The next big question then is, we've talked about, yeah, you've got to start from young. The next big question is, how do I save for that retirement, that end of life, mm. when it's forever a changing figure mm. with inflation and everything else? How do I know how much I'll need mm. when I retire? Yeah, you're you are right. I mean, what we put in place today, because the world will change and our life circumstances will change, our need will change, you know, so it's an ongoing planning. But I think a good place to start, FD, is to first start with knowing how much you are spending today. Mm. Once you know how much you are spending today, you ask yourself that when you go into retirement, no matter how early or how late it will be, will some of these expenses, are they still needed? You know, what are expenses that you don't need to incur today, but in the future, you might. Mm. Right? So that's the first good starting point. And after that, when you look at these expenses, you try and categorize it into essential and discretionary expenses. Mm. Essential expenses are what we Singaporeans call die-die must-have. Yeah. Mm. Right? Utility yeah. bills, food, you know, and uh, all that. Right? Discretionary expenses will be things that you spend on. They are good to have. Right? And for the essential part, I will say use instruments that are very certain right and a good instrument to use and you know honestly we are all very blessed in singapore uh, as singaporeans or even pr that we can contribute into our cpf mm. right and i'll say that our cpf is a very good instrument to use to save up for our essential expense right because subsequently you are going to get your cpf life payout regardless of financial condition regardless of how long you live. Mm. And perhaps, I mean, Li Hua is a much better person to talk about CPF life than me. I, I think we are going to talk about CPF <laughs> life in a moment though. But, but Bien, before we get to CPF life, did you go through all these questions when you were planning to retire? I, I would say not really. I actually started um, you know, buying insurance um, when I, maybe in my mid-twenties. Uh, most of them were endowment plans and yes, I, I have a, um, what you call it, annuity plan or mm. annuity, annuity plans. Yeah, I, I had annuity plan before. Nowadays, I, I believe no more insurance companies have that, right? Can't beat CPF life. Yeah, yeah they can't beat CPF life. <laughs> yeah, so no more, but I had it fortunately and, and I'm still getting money now from them. Okay. So yeah. Uh, I. So you did have a safety net of sorts? I, I guess so. It's just... Something I, I thought, okay, you know, it, it's more or less to support a friend, you know, who's selling insurance and all that. So, <laughs> yeah. I should have been your friend at that point. <laughs> yes, you should. <laughs> okay, let, let's get down to CPF life. And as you said, no one can compete with CPF life. Um, Lee, what? Can you elaborate how CPF life hedges against uh, longevity list, uh, risk? Uh, the the, volativ uh, the volatility in investment returns? How does that work? So, so I think BN Chris talks about CPF life essentially is an NOT product. Yeah. It is an insurance. So um, CPF life actually got against longevity risk because what is longevity risk? Basically, you outlive your retirement savings. Yeah. That's what most people worry about and yes. then you will try to hold back and you don't know whether you'll still be around tomorrow and mm. then you don't know how much to plan for. So CPF life removed this by making sure that you have a stream of income so long as you live. So okay. you're not going to run out of income streams you know, once CPF Life payout starts. So that that's solves the longevity issue. And CPF Life is invested in special Singapore government bonds, which is actually issued by the government, guaranteed. And you, you wouldn't have this worry about you know, when market is down, like what we see this year, the volatility itself. Mm. And that gets removed also. And, and so it solves the other problem about you know, having a steady income stream that you don't have to worry that it go roller coasters with the market returns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, CPF Life actually has three plans. 
the basic, which is a pretty legacy plan, um, that actually in terms of the payout, it does get progressively lower as you age. Um, it has a standard plan for people who want a level payout. And uh, of course, the latest one that we have is actually an escalating plan mm. that actually increases you know, the payout 2% each year. Okay. And, and that kind of address you know, people concerns about prices increasing on a yearly basis. And so you don't have to really change or you can maintain a lifestyle in that sense. Okay. So that essentially is, is CPF life. And, and I would recommend that actually like what Chris mentioned, for the essential part of what you plan in terms of your lifestyle, use CPF life to fund that because you have certainty that you don't have to worry about your utility bills. You can buy food, there's food on tables. Mm. You know, you can do, you know, still buy your clothes and all these things. And, mm. and that to me is quite essential. Mm. And, and that's something that you, you don't need investment knowledge. Yeah. You don't have to work on it. You know, it's CPF life takes care for you. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually the best part about CPF life. Okay, the, the other thing uh, I, I want to touch on with you, Li Huat, is, is the legacy bit. I mean, your CPF is a legacy. It's a financial legacy. Um, I, I personally just had an experience with CPF where I wanted to make sure that um, who I leave my money to was correct. Um, and I'm not saying this because I'm on this forum, but I am saying that I walked in to a CPF office. I got my nominations sorted. And I do this all the time with government departments. I timed it. I timed it. 11 minutes. I was in and out. Wow. Unbelievable. It was done. But that's not the only way to do it. Am I right? There are other ways to get your nominations in. Actually, you can get it done even faster with the e-nomination that we have rolled out. <laughs> Give me that. <laughs> Yeah, so, so actually that's what we, we see as people request. You don't have to visit the service center okay. to get the nomination done. And, and actually you can do it uh, electronically via your phone. And if you do it electronically, the witness don't see the details of what you're nominating. It's quite different from, you know, if you have a form and then you have to fill up yes, like your yes. nominees and the percentage. Yes. And then the witness sign off. Yeah. So that's the reason why actually when we wrote up the e-nomination, we make it even better. That somebody can be the witness of the... Um, uh, nominations and and then you know it can be someone you know and then they can do it by electronically also and uh, it'll be definitely much faster than 11 minutes <laughs> no but i just thought 11 minutes it was just fast. it's fast i mean fast. you know how many times have you walked into any government agency and walked out in 11 minutes i mean let's be honest they're always busy they're always a stack of people in there right but these guys are so smooth i thought it was absolutely amazing the other question i have for you uh, now that we've sorted out nominations is how do we, as Singaporeans, or, or what can we as Singaporeans do um, to make sure that we are making the best use of our CPF? So I think Chris mentioned about, first, you need to figure out what, how much you need. Mm. And, and for that, actually, on our website, there is a retirement calculator um, that can guide you to figure out actually how much you need. Then in your working life, um, I mean, Chris starts very early, 19 years old. I think I start probably nearer to 30. Mm. When I start to think about what is my you know, retirement amount that I require, I start to maintain my spreadsheet and look through and, mm. and see what's the lifestyle I want and what is expenses mm. that's mm. needed and so forth. So, so you, you, if you start early, actually the main thing is, you know, when you start to work, actually CPF life, I think Pewish mentioned, there's a magic thing called interest that yeah. is compounding. And even if you look at 4%, right, it doubles, more than doubles every 20 years. Mm. You know, and that's the beauty part about, you know, starting early. Mm. Um, and you don't have to contribute a lot. A lot of people think that, you know, when we ask them to do contributions, you know, top up your retirement sum, they think of it as, wow, it's a huge amount. But you can do $50, $10 on a regular basis. Mm. And that compounds over time and it becomes a huge amount. So that's the first thing that I will actually I'll ask, make use of the CPF systems, the compounding interest effects to actually grow your retirement sum. Mm. The other one actually is when it's time for you to do your, buy a house, you know, home ownership is, is something that Singaporeans always talk about. And we have a lot of people that owns a home. Be, be, be wise, you know, look at what is affordable and don't overstretch. 
And for that, actually, we also have a re series of calculators that can guide you. What does the mortgage looks like? You know, how much interest will be paying? You know, how, whether your CPF contributions can afford the monthly housing loan payments and all this. And if you could actually then you balance between part cash, part CPF. For the part of OA that you're not using, uh, you can consider transferring to SA and that will give you up to 5% interest mm. you know, before 55 years old. So that's actually the way that actually you, you grow and accumulate during the CPF um, working life itself. Yeah. And of course, one area I think Chris mentioned about uh, insurance. I, I do agree that you need insurance to take care of the vagaries of life you know, uh, in a comprehensive manner. But we also guard against people over buying insurance in that sense. Mm. Like we have seen people buying uh, integrated policies for their healthcare, but you know, when they go hospital, they choose a subsidized ward. So actually they don't make use of their insurance. Uh, and yeah. that, that money could have been better you know, used for other purposes. So yeah. that's the other consideration during your accumulation phase. Mm. Then the accumulation phase, which is where you, know, you start your retirement life mm. and you wanted a payout. I mentioned about CPF life earlier. Mm. Decide on your plan. You know, it's, it starts at 65. Um, but if you think that you no need it to start at 65 because there are other incomes, yeah. Uh, you can decide to start later and for every year you will get seven percent more in terms of the payout mm. and and that's something the individual can decide but we we have a limit the latest you can start is 70. so if you don't take action we, we will actually choose the plan for you okay yeah yeah so we auto start it <laughs> so that actually you can enjoy your income when you're still alive okay i, I do want to ask a question and i'm i'm going to admit this to everybody nobody here has prepped for this question but i'm going to ask it uh, I hear this a lot from young people today who are going to buy HDB. And their thought is, never mind, I empty out my CPF, like Ken. Who would like to take that on? The thought on that. I think there is the practical aspect mm. and the money wisdom aspect, I would mm. say. I think the practical aspect is that when you are young, you may not have that much cash. Yeah. That was me. I got my first HDB five-room flat when I was 25. Just started working not too long. I don't have a lot of cash, you know, and it's just practical, right? To use your CPF to put in the down payment of your house and to pay for the monthly mortgage. Mm. I mean, that's the good thing about the CPF mm. because it helps us to have home ownership as early as possible. Mm. But from the money perspective, it depends what you are doing with your cash, if you have cash. Okay. If you are you are having you have cash sitting in a bank account that's not earning, you know, that much interest rate. Of course, now people are saying like, wow, you know, I can put my money many places, you know, many places, FDT bills and all that. Yeah. Yeah, but even that is a short term. I mean, the, the interest rate environment that we're experiencing now is not something long term, right? It's short term, right? So you're going to go back one day to an environment whereby your interest rate may no longer be that exciting anymore. And if you have cash sitting in the bank account doing nothing, and instead of using your CPF money, which is earning about 2.5 to 3.5% per year, you might as well use cash to service your mortgage. Mm. But then you've got to do the financial planning aspect well because you don't want to wipe out your bank account. You have no more liquidity, no more emergency mm. fund. You use you know, all your surplus to pay for your house and right. then you can't even eat properly. You, know, you want to go to McDonald's, you think <laughs> twice, thrice and yeah. four times. Yeah, you don't want to eat rice and smell the salt fish. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a balance. So that's why I say that it's a practical aspect and there is a money aspect and well, you just have to balance you it. You need to balance it out. Yeah. Okay, uh, don't forget, Building Financial Security to Support Your Passions. It's a webinar by CPF Volunteers tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. You'll be able to pick up more tips on maximizing your money to achieve your desired retirement lifestyle. Okay, I've been waiting for this. Sports psychologist time. <laughs> okay, as a sports psychologist, what are the tips you have uh, because I think it's very important, and I am, I am guilty of this, not staying physically active. I think the biggest criminal is the television set, quite honestly. <laughs> um, but what tips do you have uh, for us to stay physically active or, or healthy as we age? Maybe before I talk about the, the tips on activity, 
Research is now showing very clearly that exercise actually improves your mental health. Mm. It reduces anxiety, reduces depression, and uplifts your mood. So just walking in the park, I mean, Singapore got lots of parks, connector parks and all that near, you know, all the estates. So, and exposure to nature also has been found to be really powerful. Mm. So the idea is that you want to use exercise as a way to de-stress, as a way to improve your health, your immunity, and also your longevity. So that to me, I think is a bigger picture because mm. if we want to live long, then we're going to find simple, easy ways and practical ways that make sense. I think sometimes we, yeah, people say, yeah, I spend a lot of money on my gym. Do I have to go, you know, do a gym? I'm not against gyms, right? Don't get me wrong. But there are still things that we can do on a daily basis. So one thing we always talk about, because I used to teach uh, physical activity and health uh, at the universities, is that um, do what we call incidental exercise. What's that? What's that? That's a good question. It means simply find ways, as many as possible, to actually work out a little bit so that your heart can thump a little bit more and clock your hours. Now, there's this Singapore Physical Activity Guidelines, that S uh, SPAC is called SPAG, you can search that online, that talks about some of the suggested tips that you can do. So I think more details can go there, but essentially, find ways to create movement. So a lot of times, most of us are seated at our desks. In fact, right now, many of us who are watching online are probably you know, sitting, sitting down, right? And so you got to find ways to get up, uh, move. So maybe we should all move and change chairs, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, so find ways to do that. Uh, let's say, for example, if you drive, drive, park somewhere further away, right? So that you can walk to the lift and maybe not take the lift, but take the escalator or at least the stairs. The problem right now in building structures is that the stairs are normally in stairwells or fire, fire wells, they call yeah, them, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So no, nobody goes there, right? So it becomes inconvenient. I remember in the 60s, um, you know, every HDB block, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, wasn't at, at lift landings were not at every level. Yes. We had to walk up or down, right? Depending on which lucky floor you stayed on, yeah. right? Now every level has got lifts. So what I sometimes do, and I really do, is I, I take like two or three levels lower and I walk up. You know, I'm, I'm 56 by the way, so I'm not any younger. So yeah, so those are the incidental things that you can do that doesn't have to be, you know, take up your time. I think Singaporeans are busy people, right? right? So they got no time, understand. So find ways to work out that you can. When you go shopping, uh, you know, grocery shopping especially, right? Don't put it in a cart, carry it. Try not to, you know, bring too much to the point you put everything in your cart, but just enough for you to carry so that you work out your arms. I know this one also might sound a little bit disrespectful for our elders. Let your elders actually hold something because that's a form of exercise for them without being, you know, overly uh, uh, putting them on physical, you know, yeah. uh, demands that are too high for them. So yeah, things so, like that. So, so the old mother's tale of get off one bus stop before the house is actually mm -hmm. a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I switch off my TV. I actually don't watch TV. Yeah. So FD, oh. I, I, need to, I need to switch off your TV. <laughs> Do that. Terminate your Netflix. It's not a habit. No. It's a habit. It's a habit. It is a habit. It's a horrible habit. <laughs> Although, I was speaking to someone the other day who turned to me and said, well, he called me silly because he said, you love your television. But you're a media Go buy person. yourself a bicycle and cycle while you watch. And you know, That's I am idea. silly because it had never occurred to me. You know what? There's another study that just recently happened. It's a meta-analysis study. That means to say they look at all the research that is done on one specific area. And they look at exercise before sleep. And they found that actually cycling is, is not bad, very good. Uh, to help you sleep better. Now, I know uh, a lot of Singaporeans have difficulty sleeping because I do workshops and stuff throughout uh, government service. And when I survey them, the average hour that the typical Singaporean has is about five to six. Of course, some people are lucky ones, eight hours, you know? Mm. But that's quite rare. Mm. That's quite rare. BN is eight hours, yeah? <laughs> oh, <laughs> She's a rare one. <laughs> She's a lucky one. But most people, five, six hours, maybe once in a while you get that seven, right? How many hours do you guys sleep? Five to six, you're right. About six, seven. Yeah. Hours. So it's, what's yours? I want to ask. Four. <laughs> you're kidding. Yeah. No, four. I think oh. it's work. Because, because we, you see, I, I do it differently. I do a morning show. So we work with uh, content from around the world. So we right. work with time zones. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, we're up late just waiting for content. Mm. So we don't. Okay. So you get, if, if you get four hours at night, you're really lucky. You'll probably get another hour in the afternoon. In fact, not just the hours. It's also the ability to fall asleep faster. Sleep well. Yes. 
That's yeah. one key thing. A lot of people toss and turn at night. I, I take one minute and I'm, do I'm gone. Not, I'm not kidding. Same. Yeah. Oh. Oh. A little bit of exercise before you sleep makes your brain and body think, I'm tired, so I'll sleep faster. So I some exercise is actually good for you. I thought the sleep. adrenaline levels from exercise ah. will keep you awake. Good question. That's where that research said, don't <laughs> exercise uh, about an hour before that. Just maybe two hours, you know, stop your uh, exercise about two hours or one hour before you go to bed. Mm. Okay. Because then your arousal level would drop and therefore you feel more drowsy and sleepy because you're tired a little bit, right? Yeah. But the idea is not work out to a point like you're going to do HIIT kind of thing, yeah. high intensity <laughs> type training. No, we're not going to kill, you know, our bodies or anything like yeah. that. But just enough to just half and puff a little bit. Maybe it's just some kinesthetics. I know BN does some exercises, you know, some push-ups, sit-ups and stuff that kind of take yeah. maybe 10 minutes before you go to bed. Minimally, at least. Good suggestions. So, yeah. Bian, do you exercise before you go to bed? Yes, I do. Um, I, every morning and evening, I have a routine. So, I do uh, 20 reps of uh, push-ups, triceps, ab work. Wow. And when I brush my teeth, I do squats. Amazing. Uh, yeah, and in the morning, I do a bit of stretches before I start my day or feed my cats. So, this could be anecdotal, you know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, evidence why you sleep eight hours, right? You say eight hours? Yeah, yeah. more than sometimes more. So, more than that, whoa. <laughs> it's so good to sleep eight hours because yes. my body clock is down. If I am, if I, even if I'm on holiday, I can't go past six hours. Mm. Oh. I, I just wake up. Wow. Because, you know, all, all the time I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in that. Yeah. Do you take naps? An hour, an afternoon, maybe. Okay. That, that's about it. That's a way of compensation, I guess. I guess, I guess. Uh, B, I mean, we're talking about you. You, you. you do all this exercise and you are looking absolutely amazing. What are your anti-aging and beauty tips? Come on, share some. I'm like any man and woman out there my age, you know. I have wrinkles, I have crow's feet, I have frown lines, I have everything, FD, you know. Um, I, I think I, I don't let age be an excuse for me to uh, stop uh, looking after myself, my general well-being. I feel, uh, you know, uh, skin care or self-care is very important and it encompasses physical, mental and spiritual mm. well-being. Mm. I feel if you look good outside, you feel good inside and, and uh, that is very empowering, mm. I, I feel, and it gives me self-confidence and it will radiate a, a positive vibe and people can feel it, you see. So that's what I, I do and um, I, every morning and evening I do have a skincare routine. Whether it works or not, it doesn't matter. But I do have a skincare routine, you know, it, it makes me feel good. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, interesting. You said if you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. A lot of people work it the other way around. They yeah. say if you're good on, you feel good on the inside, you look great on the outside. Yes. But I, I guess as I age, you know, I know I have frown lines, I have this and that, you know, so, so you know, yeah, if I, I think I feel, I, I look good outside, I'll feel good inside. I think that's the reverse, you know, when you're younger, you probably will, will be like that, I don't know. Um, yeah, and I, I do exercise uh, twice a week, an hour, I do light body weight and light weight exercise, mm. just, uh, uh, I, I feel physical exercise is important for any age group, especially our age because you know, we tend to have more health issues, osteoporosis, and uh, that's why I, I do it. Do you do that exercise at home or are you a member of a gym? At home. So it's all done, you do it on your own. Do you uh, follow videos or uh, is this something you do? My twice a week is with a personal trainer. Ah. Yeah, and uh, the rest at home, before yeah. my shower, I'll just do it. Yeah. yeah. That it's is fun, it's fun. Have you tried it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hours, hey, Edgar's hours. looking at me like, why are you, why are you making those noises? <laughs> come I'll on your radio you, show. It's interesting because everybody turns to me and does this, right? And they go, come on, FD, just do it. Yeah. And my, I know because I have done it. I have gone from 94 to 77, working with a trainer in a gym. My problem? Is getting going. Mm. Mm. It's that first step. I got that mental just toughness. Won't, mm -hmm. yeah. Discipline. Yeah. Yes. Discipline. I, because once I start it, I'll do it. I enjoy doing it. But it's just getting going. Yes. And I can't be a member of a gym because I get bored with the mm. environment mm. very quickly. I need to change my environment. Now that, that's my problem. That's why I don't do it. And I'm looking to Ed, Edgar, waiting for him to say something. <laughs> oh, you're talking, so I'm listening to you now. No, yeah. no, 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 you have a good point. Um, I guess it's tough for most people. 
The challenge yes. is, is, is time. And also, I guess it's about uh, the belief, like I said, the same, same point, the belief, and Bian also talks about it, yeah. the belief and the, and the confidence that you can do it. Um, so the key secret really is to start really small, just like in CPL, you know, you just start small $50. Yeah. Yes. Hey, that's awesome. the key. Once you start that, then it becomes a habit, exercise that is. Yeah. Right? And then that becomes something you can do. Another one that we've seen useful in the research is this, that when you have a loved one that you care about, you know, that you respect to, and whatever they say you might likely do, it's good to actually exercise or work out with them. That, then they become your kaki, you know, your buddy to exercise. Mm. Your daughters, for example. Your yeah. Buddy. Yeah. Hmm. Ah. <laughs> Interesting point. Okay. Uh, we did open up questions to everybody on our, on our Facebook, uh, on, on, on the Q&A uh, uh, section of the, of the broadcast. And here's one for Edgar. Is there a role which we can play to help our loved ones build mental toughness. This is very interesting because I think a, a lot of what we're saying here is these are parents talking about their kids because you don't have mental toughness today, you can find it hard in school. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, we do a lot of work with kids and schools and parents too. Mm. And one of the things that you need to realize is that Mental toughness, number one, is, can be built. That means it can be developed and with a little bit of practice and time spent, you can do that. Uh, in fact, I, I have on my website, uh, you guys can go on, sportsiteconsulting.com, where there's a segment called free audio and you can actually play it back and, and there's no name, email or anything like that. You just play offline, uh, online on, on that website. But the thing is this, so it's, it's something you must practice. Number two is that the role as parents is that we also need to be mentally tough ourselves because why are children watching us? Yep. So we need to set that role example for them. And so when we are faced with challenging situations, how do we respond as parents? Do we kanchong or be nervous and things like that? And the children will say, my parent cannot handle Then What am I to do? Yeah, because right? so kids they, are sponges, right? Well, yeah. yeah. And, and they pick up a lot of these uh, behavioral patterns from their parents. And a lot of times that, that's the, the environment that they're in. So parents, you, whoever you are who asked that question and all parents here, you have a role to play. So whenever you face with challenging situations with regards to your personal lives and things like that, or even your children's lives, like for example, the exams are, O levels are I think pretty much done, yeah. A levels still in the middle. So parents, you need to speak positive. Right, to your children. I think that's so important. And, but it has to be habitual. So it has to be something you do every day. Mm -hmm. Not just one time, but every day. Interesting. Bien, question for you that came through. How did you find the courage to challenge the status quo? What, what helped you most on your journey? So, because the status quo, you're retired, you're retired. You know, that's it. I stay at home, you know, look after my grandkids and I'm done. But you didn't. Okay, I have a don't, a want, a challenge, and faith. Um, you know, I don't let negativity affect me. I don't let society dictate how I should or should not live my life. Um, I want to continue to lead an independent life for as long as I can. Uh, I want to lead a healthy life so I don't have to be dependent on my children you know, when I fall sick so easily. Mm. I want to lead a fulfilling, enriching, meaningful life to be useful to society, to be relevant in society. And uh, for me, it's a challenge. I want to challenge myself to continue uh, to get out of my comfort zones, to face my fears. You know, like now I'm speaking live at a forum, my first time. Uh, give myself a clap. Yeah, well done. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's like, what, how do I find the courage? I think it's my faith, you know. I mean, I'm, uh, my Christian faith keeps me very grounded and and it gives me the strength to face whatever challenges that come my way, big or small. That faith, I understand the Christian faith, but there's also got to be a, a degree of faith in yourself. Um, I, again, I go back to the goal-getter. Mm. You know, when I, I have something in mind, I tell myself I want to do this thing. Mm. I just he says I always go blindly, you know, I just go, just go and, and chong, you know, you know, yeah, chong, chong, you know. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it's courage, maybe it's stupidity. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's me. I, I'm always challenging myself. There's no such thing as when someone says, can you do this? I say, why not? I'm willing to take on the challenge. I'll try it. 
I, I've got to say, anybody watching us today, <laughs> you you can no longer say I can't do this. You know. Yes, it's true. Yeah. No, no one can. I, I, you, you, you've just shown everybody that you put your mind to it, anything is possible. Mm. But you know, to to me, I mean, okay, I mean, not be good in everything. I, I, I know nobody's perfect. But the fact that I try, you know, to me, it's victory. There's no such thing as fa failure. So go, go and do it. Yeah, I think I think I think uh, one one thing that was said to me the other day that I've carried with me and I intend to carry with me the rest of my life is, you have winners, and you have learners. Mm -hmm. mm. You don't have winners and losers. I yeah. think we spend too yes. much time thinking we're a loser if we don't win. Right. Yeah, but True. we should learn to learn from those situations. Question for Edgar: I love the topic on mental toughness and power of words. How can we raise awareness to our people not to negatively label those who are aged 50 and above. It happens. <laughs> I guess that's all of us here, right? <laughs> <laughs> How do we raise awareness of the people not to be negative? I think it starts with us first. Again, as usual, we need to be that role model. Because when people see you successful or doing the things that seem right, mm. right, and that you're happy with what you're doing, they'll be wondering to themselves, how this person does it? That's why when I'm listening to BN, it's like, how she does it? I mean, I want to be like her when I'm at her age, Yeah. right? So it's about role modeling. It's about, you know, being prepared. It's about also kind of, in fact, you remember my first slide, it was about mental toughness where you seek challenges. Mm. Mm. Seek it, you know? Yep. The key here is don't be afraid. I think, I think as Asians, we have a tendency to worry about what others think of us. Fair enough, that's, that's the homogeneity that we have in our society. But I think with regards to our own lives, I think we should have the courage to do just what we want to do because we live our lives. We don't live for other people. Yes. But, but that's, that's seeking of the challenge though, and anyone here can answer this question. Mm -hmm. That thought process of seeking a challenge and accepting the challenge and going out and doing that, that, that starts with parenting. Well, because, yeah. no, and I, the reason why I say it starts with parenting is uh, we, we have got to stop uh, the whole idea of failure means the end of it all. Mm -hmm. Ah, mm. yes. Yeah, take a look at Silicon Valley. It is filled with failures, you know? Mm. Yes. Failure is not the end. Yeah. Mm. Can I say something very quick? When I work with athletes, you know, when you go for a sport competition, you sport as a metaphor for life, right? In a competition, only one winner, you know? Your second and third, you got two very nice titles. No, first runner up, second runner up, but they're basically first loser and second loser. Yeah. yeah. So right. everyone else in the competition would have lost. That's right. Only one winner. So have I lost? No. no. In terms of that competition, yes. But there are things that we have done well. There are things that we've done right. And so that is the key emphasis. Mm -hmm. You focus on the process and the steps, the action plan that you implemented. What were some of the things that worked for me? What were the things that didn't? Yes, I learned from that. Yeah, and yeah, day I'm not there yet, so it's a journey. So winning is also a mindset. It's that growth mindset we talk about. It's about you know not being afraid to make mistakes along the way because mm -hmm. life is about mistakes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but learning from the mistakes is key. Yeah, I think so. I, I, sometimes I stop in my own life and I go, what happens if I had never made any mistakes? And it's boring, it, I think. It <laughs> frightens me. My life would have been so boring would have absolutely been so boring. We need to embrace those and, mm. and just take it as it is. Yep. That's the ups and downs of life. No? No, I, I thought the other one that, that, you know, the questions about labeling if you're 50 yes. and above. 50 and above. That's a I label. thought the first thing is don't label yourself. Yes. I was yeah. talking to BN yes. this morning, you know, we're having a chit chat and having opinions as positive and negative. Mm. I thought the first thing is if you label yourself, actually mm. you lose. You lose control. Yeah, you lose control. But if you are not labeling yourself, then then whatever other people say is their opinions. Yeah. 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 So if you start from there, I guess you, you probably have a different mindset. You know, mm. you have a growth mindset in a sense. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, don't think of fifty lah. That means don't think of your age. Yeah. In fact, when people ask me how old am I, I actually stop and pause for a while. It's like, eh, how old am I? Because ah? I don't think about those things. It's interesting because I do. You people do. ask me how old am I, and I go, I'm sixty six. But to me, it's just a number. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like people say, when are you going to retire? And I'll go, it's the day I can't get out of bed to go mm. to work. Yeah. You know, as long as I can do it, I'll mm. do it. Yeah. 
That, that's, that's the way I live my life. Yeah. But a, a question for Christopher and Lee Huat. What are some of the daily habits that one can start on right away towards making steps uh, toward a, a financial stability in retirement? What, what, what can people do this afternoon? Yeah, I think, you know, we've been always talking about investing and all that, but I thought that there are maybe three areas that we can work on straight away. Maybe not just this afternoon, but going forward. And uh, Piyush did talk about that a bit early on. I heard the interview about whether you should plan your career or do your financial planning first. Yes. And I actually agree with him that without an income, there's nothing to plan. So work on the income. And when we say work on the income, what do I mean? I mean, always, always improve on yourself. Be the best that you can be in the work that you do. Mm. Constantly upgrading yourself with relevant knowledge. Because if we do that and we are the best in what we do, we are never afraid of losing the income. Yeah. And in fact, our income will grow. Yeah. And income is really that fuel that is going to power your financial stability. I mean, yeah. without income, there's really nothing to talk about. Mm. But the second thing is about living below your means. Right? Because as the saying goes, it's not just how much you earn that makes you rich. Mm. It is how much you save. Right? So do your budgeting. Make sure that you are spending below and not within. I mean, we always talk about within. Within means you earn $1 and you spend $1 and you have nothing yeah. to save. Yeah. Right? Spending below your means means <laughs> you can spend on this, but you don't. You can drive a nice car, but you don't. You can buy a much bigger house, but if you don't need it, you don't. Right? Yeah. So you yeah. always spend below your means and so you have got good surplus. And that's going to again power your plan to help you reach financial stability mm. much earlier. And the third thing really is about that saving. So that surplus, and you hear of this all the time, but I'm not sure how many people actually has that discipline to do that. We always hear of people say, pay yourself first. Mm. And paying yourself simply means that every month when your income comes in, in a disciplined manner, it's very easy to do that nowadays. Just put in a standing instruction with your bank and take that amount out from your bank account and put it and set it aside for saving. That comes first. Because if we cannot save, we cannot invest. Mm. If you take care of these three areas well, then we are ready actually to make those investment decisions mm. that will help us reach financial stability maybe even much earlier. Li Huat? I'll just add two more from there. Um, I've, this, this is a period where you get high interest rate environment. Yeah. I would say don't be lazy. Don't just the bank wouldn't like this, but don't, don't leave your money in the bank account earning 0.05% interest. You know, even the, 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 the fact about putting it into a fixed D actually can get you above 3%. Yeah. You know, so, so look at actually what are the safe investments that you could do. And it's not very difficult. And that actually adds on to what Chris mentioned about you have put aside for your savings. Grow that savings in a way that actually make sure that, you know, when you're sleeping, your money is still earning money. Mm. So that's one more that I'll add. The last one, of course, being CPF, and actually I'm a member myself. Consider if you're not using it, actually top up early, mm. you know, and then earn that compounding. Yeah. And, and that actually you will thank yourself when you are, you know, retiring because you make the right decisions to start yeah. early. And the compounding effect is something quite amazing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, the, the only thing I would tell anybody is... <laughs> Um, and I, I, I learned this when I was in school. Do you guys, did you guys ever go through school where we would buy stamps every month? Yes. Huh? yes. And yes. then you deposit it in yes. POSB? Yes. POSB. Yes. The Remember? The squirrel yes. card. Yes. The little card, right? Yeah. 70s. Think about this. <laughs> yes. you're, you're talking about yourselves and preparing for retirement. Yeah. I, would do, I would go one step further. Teach your kids, and I did this, yeah? Teach your kids to, when they get their allowance, to budget it and put 10 cents aside a day just to get them to put it into a piggy bank. Mm. That effect on your child and the concept of saving is amazing, right? And what we would do is we would get them to do this and then we would say, because we were able to, I'm not saying everybody is able to, at the end of the year, Christmas, we would break open that piggy bank and whatever you had in there, 
I gave you 10% of that to add on. Mm. Oh. Can I be your godson? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, 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 were, we were in a position to do it. You don't have to do that. But the idea is to get them to put that money in. Mm. And I will tell you how long mm. I have been collecting my coins. Every day I go home, I put all my coins in a bottle. Mm. Okay? I've been doing it for 50 years. Wow. So you either have a very big bottle or very <laughs> many bottles. So what I do is I, I, I do it for like three months and then I take all the money to the bank. Uh, I take oh. it three months and okay, I get it. Okay. <laughs> but I've been doing it for 50 years. Nice. And you will be surprised how much money you can save. Wow. That's a lot. Just putting your coins away on a daily basis. It is scary. It is truly scary. But for the young who are watching us, doesn't work for you because you don't know what real money is. <laughs> <laughs> They're all on tap, 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 tap. That's true. They don't know, they don't know the feel of real money. So it is a, a little in, in, interesting. Li Wat, another question. What should the minimum yield of T-bill be worth, uh, to be worthwhile for a retiree using OA to purchase? Uh, what other passive income can retirees explore? I think, I think for the audience, T-bills refers to treasury bills treasury that is bills, issued yeah. by MAS. Yes. And I think this is the hottest topic in town right now. Right now. Yeah, and um, there are so much applications that you know, MAS couldn't you know, uh, finish the auctions until late in the evening, and then they announced the cutoff rate. Mm. Wow. So if you ask me what is really a worthwhile, um, my, my advice would be, um, it's, it's really something very personal. But make sure that do not buy T-bills that's lower than 2.5% if you're using your OA. It okay. just does not make sense. But whatever, you know, you can compare what you can put into a fixed D and you compare what you can get from a T-bill, mm. actually then you can decide, you know, which actually is the better options for you. Other passive income? Um, that may be something Chris could advise. Mm. Yep. Okay, Chris. Yeah, so I generally don't believe in this whole notion of a passive income because uh, you do need to put some work. Well, perhaps the only passive income, as I was speaking to Li Huat, is probably your CPF life because you put in and then you don't really have to manage it. Yes. You don't care about it. Yes. You know, and when it's paying, you just take the money and you don't care, right? But other than that, if you are talking about other income above that CPF life, I guess you've got to make, you've got, to, you've got to do some investments, you've got to make some investment decisions. There are plenty of instruments out there and this is definitely not the session for that. I mean, there are REITs, there are bonds, there are equities that you can mm. invest in and mm. depending on your risk appetite, depending on the time horizon that you have, your portfolios may look different. You know, if you have got more time, then you can have, allocate more to equities, mm. right? Uh, and all that. But the thing is, they are not passive because you do need to spend some time understanding these mm. instruments mm. and invest it. Even, even if you are using an advisor, remember it's your own money. Yeah. You need to actually know and work with your advisor and not say, this is my money, I'm giving it to you, do whatever you want with it. Yeah. And at the end of a certain number of years, I expect this money to come back, yeah. right? So, I think it is only just responsible to spend effort, time, come for events like this, know more about these financial instruments, mm. work with your advisors to manage. So it's not really passive in a sense because you still need to put effort into it. You know, there's, I, I'm sure we have, we have young people watching and they're thinking, okay, we talk about financial advisors, we talk about financial consultants, these are the guys. Uh, some of them are known as insurance agents before. Uh, <laughs> And they're asking this question, how do I pick the right one? It's tough, right? Because nobody is going to put it on their head and say, I'm not trustworthy. Yeah, yeah. Right? Everybody <laughs> will say, you know, I'm trustworthy. I've got the best plans. Yeah. yeah, you know, and I've got the experience and all that. Yeah, it's tough. But I'll say a few things you can look for. Definitely, you look for competence, right? And competence comes in the form of education, mm. right? So you want to look at this person and make sure that this person is suitably educated. They have the right qualification. I think that's very important. Secondly, yes, experience is key. So you want to pick someone that, you know, is not in this, you know, they just day one in the mm. job. That's the other thing I would consider when I pick a financial advisor. The third thing that I would consider would be 
a person that mitigates any conflict of interest. Now, obviously, in our industry, commission is a conflict of interest. No doubt about it. Okay. Right. If you okay. earn a commission, you are conflicted. Okay. Right. And and and, I mean. You have to ask this person now. You are conflicted by commission, but how do you mitigate it? Mm -hmm. This person should give you a reasonable answer on how he mitigates uh, that potential conflict of interest. Mm. The next thing I will ask you to consider, of course, is that this person must be licensed. Don't work with somebody that is not licensed by MES. Mm. And last, definitely not least, is you know the whole financial planning relationship is a long journey. You've got to be able to work with this person in the long term. You must feel that this person is able to communicate with you, understands you, and, and be able to communicate with you in a way whereby you can understand. Please remember that if you cannot understand, it is not because you are stupid. It is because the advisor has not made it easy for you to understand. Oh, yeah. I like that. Because that's the advisor's job, yeah. not the consumer's job, right? Yeah. Mm. And if he's really competent, he would be able to digest the difficult concepts and make it simple for you to understand. So I would say these are the five traits that, uh, and things that I will look for if I'm choosing a trusted advisor for myself. Okay. We, we, uh, we do have one more question for you. Sorry, I know you've just answered that one, but we've got one more. Uh, the YOLO money equation, as described, uh, does not take into account that with longer employment, our income also rises. Uh, YOLO uh, is when, when you're young is okay. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, when I shared a conversation between my son and my daughter, mm. both of them are not wrong. Yeah. Right? Because uh, it is perfectly fine that when you are young, you want to live it up. There are experiences that only when you, were, when, when you are young, you will go for, right? So do that. All I'm saying is don't do that to the extreme. Mm. Right? Always think that there might be a tomorrow. Mm. Right? So yeah, live it up. Uh, but well, always set aside something for tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, the other question is, is it too late to apply wisdom after 55? I think the older you are, the wiser you are. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say it's never too late. Wherever you are today, nothing is stopping you to sit down today. And the end of the year is a good time yep. to ask myself, today, if I know that my time on earth is limited and the time of my loved ones, they are also limited, how would I do things differently? Mm. How will I spend my money differently? Yes. Never too late to think about this question. We've got a question from BN that I'm going to put to everybody at the panel later. Uh, besides retraining how to restart again mentally, when one realizes only in their 50s that one has been slogging in the wrong job or career during the peak hours, so other than retraining, mm. BN, can you think of anything that you would have done? Besides retraining how to start again mentally, yeah. mm, I think, I mean, like I said, for me, it's always been setting goals and, and yeah. I've always been able to achieve it. Mm. So it's a bit hard for me to say, you know, uh, about retraining. Mm. But when I came out of retirement to do uh, the cold brew, right. uh, to start all over again, I, it's not... It, it, the, the number 60 didn't occur to me at all. It was like, okay, let's start a business. Yeah. So I, I think it's all a mindset about, oh, am I too old to do it? Am I too, too uh, stupid to do it or, or whatever? It's, it's all a matter of, I want to do it. I want to achieve it. Let's do it. Don't mm. think that you're 60 years old, you're 50 years old you're, or whatever. Just do it, you know? Okay. Yeah. I know Ed, Edgar's got something he wants to say. Yeah, I'm, I'm moving around. <laughs> I, 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 He's I got exercising. something to say. I'm exercising. <laughs> Incidental. I've never said so. Incidental. I remember when I was in school, uh, my, my teacher always makes me stand on the, on the table because there's nowhere else to stand. <laughs> uh, what was the question? Other than retraining. You, you know, you've, you've, you, you, your peak years have been spent in a job that you were not supposed to be in. And now, you know, you're, you're 50 and you're going, oh, no, I got to get out of this. Yeah, 
I think for me, the question to ask each one of ourselves is this. What am I going to do that makes me happy for the rest of my remaining life? I think that's probably the most important question you want to ask yourself. And also using what you know, Chris was saying. Mm. Uh, as you sit down and ask, you know, sit down and plan, what is it that is going to make me happy? And then if happiness is that ultimate goal, then what are the things that you need to support that happiness? Mm. Right? Just like an elite athlete, they're thinking about, hey, I want to win a gold medal, right? Olympic medal, for example. Yeah. So what I'm going to do to get there? And that's, there's a whole lot of planning and, and preparation and yeah. readiness. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's my thought. Okay. One, we've got time for one last question. And I'm going to put it to each of you individually. For someone who wants to get started on planning a purposeful retirement, what's the first thing you would suggest they do? Li Huat. Um, not because I'm from CPF, but nope. personally, <laughs> I, I use it also. I, I would say that actually try to understand the different CPF products that actually can help you and, and better plan for your retirements and give you a peace of mind uh, when you start your retirement you know, stage yeah. itself. So that is something that actually I would want everyone to do. And I'm saying it because I'm a member myself, yeah. not because I'm from CPF. Yeah, and I would suggest that if you, if you do go online and you have problems understanding anything, go down and talk to them because they do explain it really well. And I'm not saying that because I'm on this platform. Edgar. My answer to that would be the first thing you do is find a way to exercise and live an active lifestyle. Mm. Because when you're healthy, then you can live that life that you want. If you're sick, you can't do anything. Agree. So all the money you have also no use. Uh. Agree. So to me, some, some balance is important. Yes, work. Yes, go and you know, plan and all. But also don't forget your health. Yeah, mm. true. Christopher. Yeah, so for me, it's, you know, a lot of our clients, when they come to my firm for planning for their retirement, they always start talking about wealth. But really, I mean, what we advocate is, and I've shared it many, many times here, is that you first make that life decision mm. before you arrange your financial decisions to support that life decision. But I mean, life decision is really fluffy, right? What, what is a life decision? Mm. So I read a book, and this book is called Repacking Your Bags. And the authors, Richard Leder and David Shapiro, has this to say. They define the good life as living at a place that you belong with the people you love, doing the right work on purpose. Mm. So that's a great starting definition for what a good life is and what a life decision should be. So think about where is the place that you belong? Who are the people that you love that you want to live with? What is the work that you want to do at retirement? in a purposeful manner. Mm. And once you have decided these things, then do your financial planning to support these activities. Mm. Yeah. For someone who wants to get started on a purposeful well, retirement. Basically, it's a, it's a purposeful retirement that they want. What's the first thing they should do? I think make sure you have uh, enough money to retire, first of all. Because I, for me, I don't... I, I always tell myself, don't be... Be independent, don't be dependent on your children. Agreed. You don't know if they will be there to look after you. So make sure that you have at least enough money to look after yourself. And you know, stay as healthy as you can for as long as you can, so that you don't have to be a burden to them because you don't know for sure if they will look after you <laughs> or, or not. Yeah, that's, that's what I, I would say. So those, uh, that's what our panel had to say, and it was all very serious. So I will give it a slightly lighter note. Purposeful retirement. My children pay, I enjoy. <laughs> so the Are first step you listen? take, make sure your children save. <laughs> very important. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christopher Tan, CEO of Provident. Uh, Edgar Tam, sports and performance psychologist and founder of Sports Psych Consulting. Uh, Mr. Tang Li Huat, uh, Chief Financial Officer of the CPF Board, and BN, thank you so much. Thank Amazing you. woman. You're a model. Thank you're thank co-founder you. of One Degree C. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for your insights, everybody. <laughs>